Hey everybody, it is Dean Z speaking to you from room 218 in Hutchins Hall. Uh, this is going to be, I hope, a fun episode. I'm just doing some quick hits from questions that have been left in the comments on the YouTube channel uh, and other things. I don't know, Dustin gave me a whole list of questions to ask and I have no idea where he's getting this from, maybe out of his pretty little head. We don't know. Uh, but I'm going to read them and answer them here today and hopefully this will be useful. Uh, okay, first one is pretty straightforward. Hi, Dean Z. Thanks for another helpful video. I noticed you were averaging the LSAT scores. Do you consider the average or only the highest when determining acceptance? Thanks. Thank you for writing. Uh, this is a reference to the episode I did with the four splitters with the high LSAT, low GPA people. Uh, and I, I do remember that in doing that, I, I said something about an average score. And so I'm so glad you asked. Far and away, the most important score is the highest score. However, uh, admissions officers see every score you take, and we also see an average. I just, I noticed it. It's like one little bit of info that goes in my, in my head. I, 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 it is, like I say, it's much less important than the high score. Um, but I guess, I guess the way I think about it is if the average score is much different than the high score, that suggests there's a, a big range of scores. And in that instance, part of me is hoping that there will be some addendum explaining why the big score gap, right? So that's really the extent of it. Um, and I also think, I guess if, if somebody has a lot of scores, uh, the LSAC, the Law School Admissions Council, has now limited you to taking uh, scores five times over is it your lifetime? Jeez, I should know this. But they've decreased the number of times you can take it. Uh, in the in the not too distant past, we would sometimes see scores, you know, nine, eight, nine scores uh, by one individual. And in that case, I really am looking at the average score because it's just, you know, if you're taking it that many times, um, it is each score has much less utility or predictive value. So in that case, I guess I would be looking at the average. But that is the exception uh, to the rule, and it is a very rare circumstance. So sorry if I created confusion about that. Um, as I say, we do see it, but the main point of interest is the high score. So thank you for asking. Next question. I'd be really interested to hear your take on the JD Next program that some schools are starting to accept. So there is a, uh, a this is a great question because uh, JD Next is brand new on the scene and here's, here's the deal with that. Um, there are, it's a group of people who are looking for alternatives, I think, to uh, the LSAT pretty diligently. I believe it is the same group of people who are also uh, uh, first adopters on um, using the GRE in lieu of the LSAT. I don't. I think I must have mentioned on here. I am not a fan of the GRE as a test. Uh, I don't. I don't think it's a good test, and it is not meant to predict anything about L, uh, law school. So we are extremely limited. Uh, we will only consider uh, the GRE if you used it to get into. Um, another program at Michigan in, your current, in which you are currently enrolled. But other than that, I, I just don't find it helpful. Um, JD Next is um, yet another alternative test, uh, and it's new, created by, um, created by the people who are uh, advocating for it. The problem, is, the, the problem with JD Next is that it, is, it has been tested on uh, people who have already been admitted to law school, which is actually one of the problems with what uh, using the GRE to uh, as, as a valid test. It, it also was used only on people who had already been admitted. So these are people who you, who have already passed some vetting and some uh, gauntlet and been deemed um, potentially good students at law school. So to then go back and give them a test and uh, use that to predict anything is kind of it's putting the cart before the horse or putting the horse after the cart, maybe, is the better way to think of it. Um, it's, you know, the decision was already made. So just, I don't want to get deep into the weeds on psychometrics, but it just is not, everybody who knows stuff about psychometrics is pretty unanimous about, like, this is not a great way to 
prove anything or test anything. So we're not using it, uh, certainly not this year. Is it possible that in some future year I will learn something that makes me think it is worth taking it? Sure, yeah, absolutely. I can imagine that happening. But we are certainly not there yet. So, um, and I will be very honest. I mean, when schools that take the GRE, if you look at the data, they're not taking very many GRE scores. P schools are still pretty into the LSAT as a metric versus the GRE. I expect you will see the same with JD Next. So I think if you want to uh, take your best shot at getting into law school, that's still the LSAT. But I, I am biased on this point in multiple different ways. Um, so, you know, take it with a grain of salt. But that, that's my personal view. Speaking of bi biased, let's read the next question. What's your LSAT, Dean Z? Here's what I have to say about that. You'll know when I apply to your law school what my LSAT is. No, just kidding. Uh, I'm not telling you my LSAT. Dustin wants me to. He thinks it would be fun. Uh, so I'll just hold that out. It's possible that someday I will tell you my LSAT, but not today. How does Michigan feel about a score cancellation on the last test? I don't know but if this question means the last test, meaning the last test that was administered uh, by the LSAC, because that the last couple tests have had a lot of problems uh, because of uh, the LSAC's partner, um, and just you know, it's been a, it's been a, a rough ride for people taking the LSAT this fall. Um, I don't know if they mean that or if they just mean you took a test, got a score, took it again, and canceled. Uh, but either way, <laughs> the answer is the same, which is. I don't care about a cancellation. If you have like 10 cancellations or something like that, I notice uh, that looks like um, something is happening there um, psychologically, but, and I don't know what it is. So if you, if you do have that, if it's a lot, you should probably explain that. Um, but one cancellation, I assume that that would mean that it's a lower score than whatever your prior test was, but that's fine. I don't care. Don't worry about it. Don't let once cancel scores. Not, no one's going to be upset about that, I promise you. It, and th it, this is definitely not something that is unique to me, I swear. Next questions. <laughs> did that, did that, did that, not doing that, did that. Oh, what admissions advice do you have for a non traditional mature student applying to law school? Uh, first, I want to say I feel like non traditional, that was a, a phrase that was. Uh, really used a lot when I first started in admissions two plus decades ago. And I feel like it has really faded. And I think that is because there really isn't a non-traditional student so much anymore, or at least not to the extent that there was back in 2001. Um, it used to be many more people were coming straight through from undergrad to law school. And now, uh, you know, most people are taking a year or more off so it's sort of hard to say where's the line between you know a typical you know couple years off versus something that is then so many years off that it's non-traditional. I don't know where that is, um, but I get your point. Let's just let's just assume um, you are 45. No, let's assume you are 38 and applying to law school, and you are a mother of three children because that's what my mom did. And uh, so my advice would be, I mean, first of all go you, that's amazing. Uh, it is really hard uh, to branch out in life and take these kinds of risky steps. And I inc admire that incredibly. Um, I am actually thinking right now of a, an applicant I spoke with at an event, I remember this so long ago in Atlanta, who was amazing. Uh, and, I, and I know that she um, watches these because she sometimes texts me and we've, she, we've stayed in touch. But she was also uh, a mom and, uh, and I was very inspired by her, although she did not end up, uh, I believe, going to law school. My advice would be, um, obviously, you know, you're, you're, you're making different calculuses than someone who's 22, right? You should be, in terms of choosing law schools, um, 
you need to be thinking about what's best for you and anyone else in your life. Um, and you shouldn't be worried uh, uh, about rankings to the same degree. You shouldn't be worried about uh, a variety of things that uh, you may have been more worried about, say, 16 years before. Um, so that, that's one thing, like don't let other people tell you how your decision should be made. Don't you know, read things that are uh, written by 22 year olds and think like, oh my gosh, this, I'm thinking totally different things. Am I thinking about this wrong? No, you're not, you're in a different place. You probably don't need that advice from me because you are um, already you know, at a place in your life where you've had enough experience that you're gonna have perspective that you didn't have when you were 21 or 22, that no one has usually at that age. You're gonna have a sense of what isn't, isn't important, and that's a huge asset to you, uh, both as a law student and as a lawyer. So have that confidence. Then in terms of practical advice about admissions, I'd say recognize that one of your big assets in the admissions process is going to be your work experience. So make sure you are very clear about that. So make sure that all your employers, that you describe what they do and describe what you do for them. That doesn't mean 50 bullet points for each employer. Um, you still only want a couple, you know, the big highlights uh, from each job. Make sure it's clear and make sure you are presenting that information um, in the most persuasive way you can. And really, I would, I would put my emphasis there and then also in your essays. And in your essays, um, I would say in general, I, I don't expect people to say, here is why I want to go to law school. It's fine if that is what they say, but most um, essays don't include something explicit like that. Uh, in your case, you may want to be more explicit because, of course, the admissions office is going to be thinking, wow, this person is you know, really going to change their life a lot to have to go to law school, so I'd like to know why they're making this choice, which isn't so much an open question when someone is coming straight through from undergrad. So. My main message to you, though, is good for you, good luck, and uh, I hope it goes beautifully. Okay, I have a very specific question here. Uh, I got mostly A's in my first two years of college, but then got two C's, one D, and an F during my senior year, as well as two withdrawals. I graduated with a final GPA of a 3.74. Do you think I have any significant shot of getting into a top 14 law school? Do you think I should bring the reasons behind this poor for performance, paren, mental health, in any of my essays? You certainly have a significant shot of getting into top law schools, but you're gonna have to address this. You, uh, this is tricky. Um, I just did a, an episode uh, about, you know, it is not, incumbent on you to explain everything in your life to an admissions office, and that would include mental health issues. But in this case, I think that last, uh, I guess, is it your last semester? Uh, oh, just during the year as a whole. During that last year's performance is gonna be a big old question mark in the, in the mind of any reviewer. I've already mentioned in many episodes that I do not go through the transcript with a fine tooth comb, but this, this performance will jump out. Um, so yeah, I think you need to address it, and I think it, that can be very straightforward. It, I'm talking four or five sentences. I wouldn't go into um, a long story about you know what your symptoms were or how it felt or anything like that. I would do this as an addendum, and I would say, in my in the summer before my senior year, uh, I got a diagnosis of depression. Making that up, obviously, I don't know what the issue was, but you know, got a diagnosis of depression. Um, I got treated, uh, but it took some time for the medications to take effect. And you know, it's a common um, part of depression to have, you know, a certain mental fogginess, and that really afflicted me in my senior year. Uh, I have now, you know, turned a corner. I am doing very well, and it has been a long time since I had these symptoms or felt this way uh, and it has made me much more aware of my own mental health and I am confident that in law school even with the stresses of law school I will be uh, attending to it and um, will be able to thrive. So that's, that's the arc. You want to explain what happened, you want to do it clearly, you want to do it dispassionately and then you want to say don't worry I got this. Uh, yeah so good luck to you. Thanks for that question.
Okay, and this, I understand, comes from Reddit. Uh, in a post about how I will write sometimes personalized notes on letters that I send to people or encouraging them to apply. And it reads thusly. On mine, she wrote, quote, decent LSAT, but your GPA is trash, bro. Looking forward to denying you. And I was like, damn, Dean Z, you don't talk like this on the podcast. And with the weak grammar, too. Whoever wrote this, I, I, I think I... Uh, you're my favorite. I love this. Please tell me who you are so I can actually write this um, on, your, on your letter. Uh, or, I don't know, just send you a special letter. Uh, yeah. You're winning a prize for this. It made me laugh. Okay. Last question. Hey, Dean Z. I took some college credit plus courses during high school that, while aren't while they aren't horrible by any means, do not quite reflect my capacity demonstrated during my time as a full-time undergraduate student. Is an addendum warranted under these circumstances, or would it be simply crying over spilt milk? Great question. I do think a brief addendum is a good idea here. Uh, we see, first of all, we see this all the time. People all the time, and it's, it was really interesting when I first started missions and realized that this was a thing, that people in high school will take college courses, not do as well, um, and and then get stuck with that college grade when they're applying to law school. Um, I, would, I just would never have thought of that as a consequence of taking college courses when you are a high schooler. Um, so it, it is, it's a bummer that you have to deal with that, but uh, you know, that it's bringing down your GPA, because I, I kind of think it has nothing to do with anything. And if I were the queen of the world, that would not be included in the cumulative GPA that we are looking at. Um, but it, since it is, I do think saying a couple sentences about those three grades that aren't great, those are from before I attended college. Um, and I took them because my high school didn't offer courses or whatever it is. And um, I really wish, uh, in retrospect, that I had had the maturity to take college classes. But in retrospect, evidently, I didn't. Please see the rest of my transcript where I knocked it out of the park or whatever. Uh, all right, I hope that was useful. Thanks so much for the comments and questions. I love getting those. So if you have more, please leave them below. Uh, sometimes I will just answer them uh, you know, in text below, but I love when we get enough good ones that we can do an episode like this. So thanks to Dustin, as always, for compiling them. And uh, wherever you go, go blue.